The holidays are over and the new year is taking off like a rocket, especially for the disgraced, twice impeached, four times indicted ex-president who's facing a legal obstacle course in the coming weeks and months. As we mentioned at the top of the show, we could get Trump's reply in the presidential immunity case any minute. And there's new reporting that Donald Trump is expected to appeal the 14th Amendment ruling from Colorado and Maine sometime today. Oral arguments begin in the presidential immunity case in one week, 48 hours after that, closing arguments begin in the New York civil fraud trial, quickly followed by the Iowa caucuses. And then 24 hours later, the second E. Jean Carroll defamation trial. That is just the next two weeks. We've talked about this harrowing high stakes legal calendar before, but now, well, it's go time. We are back with Harry, Tim, and Basil. Harry, we're going to have to get a, a bigger wall for that graphic, given the number of things that are happening over the course of, of just a few weeks. You have all these courts firing on all cylinders simultaneously, civil courts, appeals courts, presumably the Supreme Court before too long. All roads point to Donald Trump. Have we ever seen a defendant face something like this? I never have. You know, he's on he's on the shore looking at the tsunami coming in. And it's not just all roads point to him, but all roads point to deadly damage to him, either terrible financial damage in these financial trials or literally a loss of liberty. So one after the other. And as you say, these are just the next two weeks. We can we'll go on and on of this and interwoven with campaign uh, activity. All of them look are, are potentially ruinous, certainly together. They are they are potentially ruinous. I, I think it's unprecedented. Well, Tim, a, a two part question for you, which is like first, just from a logistical standpoint, how does Trump's legal team juggle a caseload with a client who is also as difficult as Trump? We've already seen with some of these cases him testifying to one thing in one case that's actually damaged him in one of the other cases. So question one, question two, is there just one of these cases that you're going to be watching most closely that you think poses the greatest risk to Trump? So the first question, Alicia, there are multiple teams that don't assume that there's sort of one master plan or one brain trust of coordination. I have a sense that there are different groups of lawyers who are focused on each of these matters. There, there's some overlap, but he has hired, understandably, specialists, right, constitutional lawyers that will argue that the, the 14th Amendment matter, criminal defense lawyers who will defend the criminal charges and lawyers who are really civil litigants in the cases in New York City. The, the one point that's interesting about timing is, is that I think the Department of Justice for a long time was very reluctant to do anything that might see, be seen as political, right? Mm -hmm. The Attorney General of the United States got that job in part because he was confirmable and seen as almost apolitical, and they kind of resisted really looking at the political aspects of, of January 6th and the attempt to uh, prevent the transfer of power. It really wasn't until the select committee started presenting real evidence that this was a criminal conspiracy that they finally took the steps to do that investigation, which have now accelerated and resulted in this investigation. Ironically said then, their desire to avoid politics in the very beginning of Attorney General Garland's time in that position has resulted, in for, unfortunately, in sort of a late to the party uh, prosecution, which means that it does impact with the political calendar, exactly kind of the opposite effect of what an apolitical attorney general would want. So that be that as it may, with that water under the bridge, they're aggressively moving now, even if they got a late start. But it is kind of weird that their initial desire to, to, to avoid politics is bringing these cases right in the middle of an ongoing primary election campaign. Yeah, I mean, Basil, I think you can call it weird. I also think you can call it frustrating for a lot of people who are watching this happen, saying there was no way it was ever going to be perceived as apolitical right. by, by Trump supporters. He was always going to make the argument that it was political. So I, I want you to talk about that. I also want you to talk about the fact that you have th these two cases, the E. Jean Carroll case, you have the civil fraud trial in New York. Trump's only showing up to one of them, right? <laughs> like, I think that's kind that's of right. a tell. The fact that he's he keeps saying, I wasn't on the campaign trail. Nobody needed him at the civil fraud trial. There's a lie baked in there. But that he, he seems to perceive one as a greater risk than the other. Yeah, I know. It's interesting because if you were to take both of them, they create this extraordinary narrative that someone running against him could use. A, you're a sexual abuser. B, 
you're not who you say you are. All the money and, and stature that you say you have, you don't. All of those things normally would be uh, grounds for someone to either walk away from that campaign or lose that campaign. Uh, but he clearly is is going through these both of these cases and others as this aggrieved, look at how people are coming after me, weaponizing law enforcement, weaponizing the courts, and so on. Um, but it is also clear that he, with the Eugene Carroll case, if he doesn't want to be in the room, Maybe he doesn't want the, that, that finger pointing. He's afraid to go up against E.G. Mm -hmm. Carroll, right? Just she, in she has her proven person. formidable for certain. Absolutely right. In her person. I, 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 I think very clearly, though, that in wanting to be present with, uh, in the case with Attorney General Tish James, um, it actually tells me, and I could be wrong, but it tells me about his regard for black women, particularly mm -hmm. black women in power. Um, and his need to sort of subjugate them and her in particular, because he feels that that he has some wiggle room with that, or he has some tr runway with that, versus what he has with e. Jean, in the E. Jean Carroll case. And if I think about all the ways in which he has talked about the African Americans that are involved in all of these cases, um, it fits a, it fits to me a, a broader pattern. But if I take all of these cases, um, it's again, it suggests to me that there is every bit of a narrative that's there for someone to go after him, but he clearly does not care, and it clearly has not worked against him in the ways that it would a, a typical candidate. You'd also need some